Throughout the Cold War, only one other nation stood as much a thorn in the side of the United States as its superpower rival of the Soviet Union. That nation was the small island state of communist Cuba. Of all the countries to fall under communist influence, Cuba was in the most strategically compromising location for the United States, right on its doorstep. But it makes you wonder, why didn't the US ever launch a serious military campaign to bring Cuba back in line? After all, when the threat of communism came to Korea, the US responded with military action. When the threat of communism came to Vietnam, the US responded with military action. But when communism came to Cuba, an island just over 100 miles off the coast of Florida, the US just sort of allowed it to happen, and after only a single attempt, seemingly gave up. Since the island's liberation from Spanish rule in 1898, Cuba had remained well within the American sphere of influence, to the point of being essentially a protectorate of the US. That influence would wane during the 1930s as the US was forced to deal with the domestic effects of the Great Depression, while simultaneously a coup within Cuba installed a more independently minded government, albeit one still cooperative with the US. This government, however, would gradually fall deeper under the influence of Colonel Fulgencio Batista, a politically malleable figure whose actions often proved more self-serving than good-intentioned. While Batista had originally continued the reforms of his political coalition, it soon became clear that his agenda had not been for a freer or more prosperous Cuba, but rather greater wealth and power for himself. After years as a shadow president operating behind the scenes, he would ultimately seize power and transform Cuba into a deeply corrupt, abusive, and mismanaged state. For the United States, this had been the outcome that they had historically intervened within Cuba and other Latin American countries to prevent. However, Batista's willingness to sell out his nation for a preferential partnership ultimately earned him just enough support from American companies and financiers to keep him in power. While some Americans were appeased with this outcome, and came to see Batista as a friend at best and a necessary evil at worst, most Cubans were not satisfied with the state of things and in fact grew even more resentful as a consequence of this betrayal by Batista, leading to the emergence of a militant insurgency. Eventually, Batista grew so unpopular for his corruption, poor statesmanship, and brutality toward Cuba's citizenry that the US officially ceased its support for him, encouraged him to step down, and ultimately granted recognition to the newly formed government of Fidel Castro, not realizing Castro carried deeply anti-American sentiments and was becoming increasingly sympathetic to communist ideals. The breaking point came with the warming of Cuban relations with the Soviet Union and the nationalization of American-owned industries within Cuba. Then President Dwight Eisenhower felt that enough was enough, and prepared an operation to remove Castro from power. What was initially a mere plot to support a local insurgency against Castro's forces, grew into a full amphibious landing operation that was meant to see direct US organization and support on land, sea, and air. But this was all intended to be achieved under the guise of a naturally occurring uprising. This desire to cloak America's role in the operation would ultimately lead the landing to change locations from the strategically valuable municipality of Trinidad to the more difficult to traverse Bay of Pigs. Further, air support would later be pulled out of fear that American involvement would be discovered. Worst of all, despite the means to overwhelm the island with the full local strength of the American armed forces, the US strictly limited itself to an invasion force comprised primarily of Cuban exiles, numbering just over 1,000. The need to mask the operation is understandable, especially given the fact that the Soviet Union had threatened nuclear retaliation if Cuba was directly invaded by the US, but realistically such an action in response to an island well within the US's sphere of influence is unlikely and this was most probably just a bluff. What this invasion ultimately amounted to was a half-hearted mismanaged effort that the US still received blame for, and which made then-President Kennedy appear weak while emboldening the Soviets to take advantage of this new asset behind enemy lines. Shortly thereafter, the Cubans, feeling that the threat of American domination grew stronger by the day, deepened their partnership with the Soviet Union and arranged for the stationing of Soviet nuclear missiles within Cuba, something which would ultimately result in the Cuban Missile Crisis, bringing the world closer to the threat of nuclear annihilation than anything prior. Of course, the crisis would be diffused, but communist Cuba would persist, and prove to be a constant pain and liability for the United States for the remainder of the Cold War. But what if that changed? What if in an alternate timeline, the Bay of Pigs invasion succeeded. Now there are multiple ways to go about achieving this outcome, but also multiple complications that need to be taken into account. Immediately we might consider a Bay of Pigs invasion that doesn't involve the Bay of Pigs at all, but rather the original landing site of Trinidad. Trinidad was in a strategic position that was easily defendable, had multiple avenues of escape in a worst case scenario, and was in close proximity to already existing anti-Castro insurgents who could be reinforced and emboldened by the invasion. The key issue with Trinidad is that without a large enough airstrip to receive the bomber planes involved in the operation, these bombers would need to return to American-held bases, making US involvement obvious. Regardless of the location, if we assume President Kennedy had continued to provide air support to the invasion force, the odds would have shifted significantly against Castro's men. 
Both of these propositions demand the US take an overt position of intervention within Cuba despite threats by the Soviet Union, which very well may not have had any real weight, especially when we consider the later Cuban Missile Crisis and an evident mutual reluctance to initiate nuclear war. The problem then is that masking American involvement was not only meant to prevent unwanted international reactions, but also to inspire native Cubans to willingly turn against Castro's government and back what was meant to be a seemingly organic rebel movement. And the issue with that is that Castro at this point had managed to win over a fair deal of the Cuban population, most predominantly its lower class of workers and a great deal of students, though that didn't stop Castro from arresting over 50,000 individuals for alleged counter-revolutionary sympathies just prior to the Bay of Pigs invasion. In the eyes of many, Castro was a strong man like Batista, but one who actually seemed to care about the common Cubans' plight. And while conditions in Cuba would grow worse over the years, Castro's first years in power would be marked by a noticeable improvement in the standards of living when compared to the Batista regime. With that being said, it would have taken serious propagandizing to turn the majority of Cuba against Castro in those early days. Though alternatively, if Castro were killed, then loyalty to the government might falter. Cuban interests of the day were not dominantly socialistic, but rather nationalistic. There was a growing desire for independence from American influence, which, because of Batista, came to be associated with corruption and exploitation. A pro-American or simply anti-communist Cuban leader who still puts Cuban interests first would be the ideal. Someone like South Korea's Park Chung-hee or Chile's Augusto Pinochet. In our timeline, we saw how pro-American leaders quickly lost favor or momentum when their prime interest was not in the strengthening of their country, but in selling it out either for personal benefit or the benefit of foreign entities. President Theo of South Vietnam is one such example. Inversely, we also saw during the Cold War the rise of leaders who, although aligned with the communist bloc, gained support primarily because they were advocating for national independence from a foreign power. Once again, as was the case for Ho Chi Minh in North Vietnam. In the minds of many Cubans at the time, they simply wanted greater autonomy under a competent, sympathetic leader, and even if they disagreed with far-left ideology, Castro was the best they could hope for. Faith in a better alternative from the US was low, and the United States didn't exactly have a clear replacement in mind, except perhaps brief Prime Minister José Miro Cardona, who didn't exactly inspire great confidence in the Cuban people. On top of all this, it's also been asserted that both the Soviet Union and Cuba were well aware of the invasion prior to its occurrence, and thus had the ability to prepare ahead of time. And of course, we must also consider the sheer resistance that Castro's men put up. In anticipation of an American assault upon Cuba, Castro took to bolstering Cuba's defenses in the months since his assuming of power arming some 50,000 pro-government citizens to serve as a militia, and doubling the size of Cuba's armed forces. Clearly, this is a complex situation that demands multiple added factors be considered if there is any real chance of success. So let's assume that for the sake of this scenario, the United States is able to launch an invasion either at the Bay of Pigs or Trinidad, and link up with anti-Castro rebel forces. Enough propagandizing has occurred within Cuba to turn a good portion of the population against the government, or perhaps these so-called counter-revolutionary sympathizers imprisoned by Castro are liberated and armed to bolster the anti-Castro army. Let's also suppose that this anti-Castro army is led by a capable and charismatic anti-communist native of Cuba, who the US happened to find among the Cuban exiles. By the end of April 1961, Cuba would be in a state of civil war broadly divided among a pro-American national front in the northwest and southern coast, and a pro-Castro force along the northern coast and southeast. Being so far removed from the Gulf theater, the Soviets are unable to provide any significant support, and unwilling to follow through on aggressive threats against the US which might escalate the regional conflict into a more destructive global war. Inversely, the US is able to provide overwhelming support to the national front once it gains significant footing and the US could easily justify lending aid to what would be framed as freedom fighters against Castro's oppressive regime, possibly even utilizing a false flag attack upon American soil to justify directly intervening in Cuba, much in the same vein as the unused Operation Northwoods. If such a thing occurred, the North Cuban coast could be easily assaulted by American naval forces, utterly crippling the communist faction. Havana falls within a matter of weeks, and Castro, if he is not captured and executed, would flee to the Cuban southeast to continue a guerrilla campaign, or go into hiding elsewhere in Latin America, likely falling in with other far-left guerrilla organizations, but in the long term, fading into obscurity. For Cubans, their future is now one of stability and steady growth, largely autonomous, but still closely under America's watchful eye. There is no aggressive restructuring of the economy in the fashion of Castro's controversial revolutionary offensive, nor does the country suffer a massive brain drain from its upper classes being arrested, executed, or fleeing to other countries, placing Cuba in a prime position to develop naturally and benefit from balanced American investment instead of exploitative economic control or no American investment at all. 
For most intents and purposes, Cuba proceeds into the 21st century as one of the most stable and economically successful Latin American countries, albeit one that would still likely remain under a dictatorship until the Cold War's conclusion. The re-securing of Cuba redefines the future of America's approach to the Cold War. With the toppling of communist Cuba, President Kennedy, rather than coming off as weak and unsure to America's enemies, is instead seen as a cunning strategist willing and capable of defending America's interests. The Cuban Missile Crisis never occurs. Additional pro-communist threats within North and South America never gained the added momentum that was provided to them, both directly and indirectly, by Castro's Cuba. Without the insecurity of a Soviet asset deep within the American sphere of influence, on top of a growing list of seemingly strategic failures, the US has never forced to draw its infamous line in the sand in regards to Vietnam, asserting that it would not fall to communism. And thus the escalation of the Vietnam War which occurred in our world doesn't happen. Kennedy felt early on that America's role in the conflict was precarious and risked growing into something much larger, which would prove unsustainable, in essence suggesting that Vietnam was not worth the effort. Without the need to restore America's credibility through the holding of Vietnam, the region gradually falls to the sidelines of American interests, while tension instead turns to South America and Africa, the latter of which experienced significant decolonization during and in the lead-up to Kennedy's presidency, and now saw Soviet meddling in an attempt to sway the continent over to their side. In our timeline, both Latin America and Africa were prime targets for Cuban intervention in line with Castro's vision of an anti-colonial global revolution. Under Castro, Cuba provided funding, military support, and organizational communications infrastructure for socialist governments and movements across the American and African continents, all with the intention of overwhelming and exhausting the United States, leaving it unable to effectively fight the Cold War. In Castro's own words, creating dozens of Vietnams. Communist Cuba involved itself in the affairs of 17 different African countries, including but not limited to Ethiopia, Algeria, Mozambique, and of course Angola, where Castro saw to the investment of tens of thousands of Cuban troops and a massive supply of weaponry, much at the expense of the Cuban public. We are losing money! Without Cuban support and with American resources freed up to support pro-Western movements within Africa, conflicts like the Somali-Ethiopian War and the Angolan Civil War, not to mention connected conflicts like the South African Border War, would have drastically different outcomes, altering the geopolitical map and shifting the Cold War playing field. Angola is often thought of as the Vietnam of Africa, and stands as a true proxy conflict with true intervention from the major Cold War players and local players as well. The fall of Angola's government to communism and the subsequent anti-communist insurgency which followed would not only cripple the country for decades, but have a ripple effect throughout South and Central Africa, contributing to Zaire and South Africa's destabilizations, allowing Namibia to assert its independence from South Africa while courting it deeper under the pro-communist sphere, not to mention allowing the pro-communist African National Congress to operate and orchestrate terror and guerrilla attacks upon South Africa from within Angola's borders. In this alternate timeline, South Africa is able to remain the dominant and shaping pro-Western power in the region, being able to more effectively combat and remove pro-communist insurgencies or governments from Namibia, Angola, Mozambique, Zambia, and Rhodesia. In many ways, South Africa was to the Western bloc what Cuba was to the communist bloc, a more militantly engaged tertiary power with something of an independent streak that sometimes put them at odds with the rest of the bloc. It makes perfect sense then that as Cuba sought to stoke communist uprisings within the South Central African sphere, so too would a rivalry emerge between it and South Africa, which, in our timeline, the Cubans were ultimately able to win, albeit at great cost to themselves. Once again, with Cuba gone, South Africa's opponents in the region are unable to compete and are ultimately put down. Though the United States is likely to become more involved in the African theater of the Cold War without a heavier investment in Vietnam or Cuba, it's not likely to bog itself down in the region given an increasing disillusionment with post-colonial governments which occurred during the same period. The US would still provide financial, logistics, strategic, and resource support to pro-Western governments and insurgencies, South Africa included. Direct American focus would instead concentrate on communist movements within South America and within Europe, in line with Operation Condor a collaborative project with the dictatorships of South America to strategically and ruthlessly suppress socialist ideology in which a number of European countries had expressed interest in utilizing domestically. Despite Cuba's relatively small stature in global politics, it found itself in a position of great strategic value during the Cold War, and in our timeline took full advantage of that position to attack and undermine the Western powers on several levels, creating a sense of American security, diverting American resources away from more productive efforts, and propping up new threats for the West whenever it saw the opportunity. The US of Z thanks you for watching. Support your legion by liking the video or join our ranks by subscribing for more. Mr. Z, out.